Okay guys, I welcome once again to another episode of Scott Talks Law. So this is an episode whereby Scott Talks Law. And in this episode, we shall be talking about uh, the law of agency under commercial law. So the law of agency, this is the law that uh, deals with the relationship between three parties. The principal, the agent, and the third parties. So under this law of agency, the three parties are involved. The principal, the agent, and the third parties. And the agent is appointed by the principal who um, does the work uh, assigned to him by uh, the principal. So the principal is the one that appoints the agent. And the agent deals with the third parties in running or in um, serving the principal or doing the task uh, permitted or given to him by the principal. So uh, the relationship between the principal and the agent is equivalent to that of master-servant relationship under vicarious liability. So a master appoints the servant who does things according to what uh, the, serv- the master wants or according to the wants of the master. So the law of agency is that law that deals with the relationship between the principal and the agent. An example is where the principal is a shareholder of a company who will appoint a director, in this case uh, the agent, and this agent will act as a director in running that company as he deals with the third parties in running a company relationship with the affairs of the company so the company the share company shareholder is the principal and the director is accountable to the principal and the director here is the agent and the the agent will deal uh, with the third parties or in, will run the company on behalf of the principal so uh, in this episode shall be talking about uh, the law of agency how the age formation of agency agency by estopel agency by the operation of the law, agency by co- cohabitation, and how agency is formed, the types of agencies, and uh, the duties and obligations of both the principal and the agent, and how the agency can be terminated if the time has expired, if, the, if that uh, trust given to him by the principal, that trust given to the agent has uh, already been performed, then can be... T- so we're going to look at all these things and we shall understand about this law of agency. We're also going to examine some case laws and case studies that will help us to understand about this law of agency. So uh, the law of agency is that law that is the relationship between three parties, the principal, the agent, and the third parties. So um, the status that like that of master-servant relationship and uh, we, we have a uh, estate agents act and the company acts and the advocates acts that can relate to this agent relationship the law of agencies so uh, the, the, let's look at the functions of the agent or the how the agency can the agent can represent the principal so the agent can represent the principal in uh, making of a contract if you, this is a thing that involves uh, making a, of a contract the agent can represent a principal in drafting that contract in uh, the whole procedure of making the contract so the agent can the agent can also represent the principal in instituting an action in court so an agent can also represent a principal if is an as the agent here is an advocate the advocate can uh, represent the principal who can be the client in instituting an um, uh, an action in court uh, in for the principal so in conveyance of immovable or other property, an agent, an agent can also represent the principal in conveyance or in movable, immovable property. So uh, in the transfer of ownership on that particular property. So the principal can appoint an agent to help him in that conveyance on the transfer of property. And another instance is where the exercise of any proprietary rights uh, of the principal under by virtue of power of Antony. So the agent can also represent the principal in exercising any uh, proprietary rights uh, of the principal under the virtue of power of attorney. And this power of attorney is that document that uh, is given to the agent that stipulates the uh, that, that, that document that authorizes the agent to carry out uh, proprietary rights. So the agent will have this um, power of attorney, that document that... Uh, Will help or will help him in the in that exercising that proprietary rights to will help him in conveying that uh, proprietary rights. So if this agent has that document that will help in the conveyance of these proprietary rights, then the agent can uh, 
represent the principle in exercising any proprietary rights of the principal under the power of Antony. So the agent represents the principal in making the contracts, in uh, instituting actions, in conveyance, and in representing him in exercising of any proprietary rights under the power of Antony. So they let's look at the legal nature of agency. So uh, the, under the contract, the agency is authorized to act for and establish legal, bi legal binding relationship between his employee and third parties. So the agent represents the principal in relationship with the third party. So the agent will lead to the third parties. So um, the agent is authorized to act and establish legal binding relationship between his employee, his employee and third party. So he establishes that legal relationship between the employer, the principal, and the third parties without pre being privy to or liable under the contract of his own account. So the agent is not liable in that relationship between the principal and that party, third party that is created by him. So the agent is not liable in that piece. We just established that legal relationship between the principal and third parties. So uh, no rights or benefits accrue to him under the contract with third parties in absence of an agreement uh, to assume personal liability. So he does not assume personal liability because he's just acting as a representative of the principal. He just represents the principal in the relationship with the third parties. So as a general rule, the principal is bound uh, by such acts as are within the agent's authority and defined uh, by the deed or other contractual documents or in the terms under which he was appointed. So the authority is the care of which the, the authority is the care of the agency relationship may be pro the authority in the care of the agency relationship may be provided or presumed actual or uh, as terrible. So the agent here just uh, represents the principal in relationship with the third parties, but the one who is liable he, the, in the relationship with the third parties. So, so we have types of agents and uh, we have uh, special agents and general agents. So general agents are those uh, agents who have a uh, general task. They're just appointed for a uh, general task and they have extensive powers. Their powers is not limited. And special agents, we are, we are those uh, agents that are appointed for particular tasks. We have a uh, specific tasks that are appointed for those agents. They cannot go beyond those tasks that they are appointed to do. They're just appointed for specific tasks. So there are two types of agents. You have general agents and specific or special agents for a uh, specific task or particular tasks. So um, the concept of authority, uh, we have three types of authority. And the principal has that authority. So under this concept of authority, uh, we have actual authority, we have ostensible or apparent authority, and we have a presumed authority. So actual authority uh, is given by the agent, by the principal. The principal uh, gives this authority to agent to perform particular tasks according to the contract or agreement that they have entered the relationship that exists between them. And ostensible authority or apparent authority and uh, this is the, uh, appears to have that authority by the relationship of principle of conduct or, or um, kind of work or conduct of parties. So ostensible or apparent authority is that authority given according to the conduct that exists or the, ki the kind of uh, relationship that exists between the agent and the principal. And uh, the conduct of parties, how these parties conduct themselves. So that relationship that is determined by the conduct uh, between these uh, people, that one is referred to as the apparent authority or ostensible authority by reason of uh, people's conduct or kind of, uh, kind of work or the conduct of parties, how these parties conduct themselves. And another one is the presumed authority. And these types of authority that the law presumes that uh, an agent has, that one that is presumed by the law. So uh, let's look at the formation of agents, agents, agency, and agency can be formed uh, either by operation of the law, by SOPL, by uh, the cohabitation, and all those uh, situations. So where the formation of agency 
Well, the way the law pre prescribes uh, no particular manner of the law prescribes no particular manner in which agency can be formed. So the contractual relationship and the agent may arise in any one of the following ways. The contractual relationship and agent may arise in any of the following ways. So the relationship, that contractual relationship may arise in any of the following ways. So you have that. Uh, so under the formation of agency, the contractual relationship or the agency may arise in following, the following ways. So we have express appointment and we also have uh, agency by cohabitation. We have agency uh, by operation of the law, agency by rectification or signing and agency by estopay. So agency by express appointment, uh, this is where the principal appoints uh, the agent either orally or in written. And uh, he appoints him for a particular task and uh, there is no formalities required here. The only exemption is where they, it involves the, the transfer of powers from the principal to the agent to execute a deed on behalf of the principal, in which case the appointment must be uh, by the deed known as the power of Antony. So the, if that uh, principal intends to transfer authority to the agent, then it must be by the deed of power of Antony. That document must state that uh, agreement of conferring power. So there's no legal formalities. There's no much formalities under the express appointment. And this is just uh, where the agent has been given power, either written or orally by the principal to perform a particular task. So agency by estopel, this is that agency that is determined depending on the relationship that exists between the mass, the principal and the agent. So the court will, uh, st will uh, come to conclusion that there is a relationship that was established or there is a particular relationship that was established to uh, prove that there existed an agreement or agent agreement that will uh, stop this uh, principal from going against the agreed terms or the terms agreed in the agency. So by apparent authority or by conduct is that of estopel, by apparent authority. For example, a person may conduct himself or themselves in such a manner to suggest that, to suggest and lead to others to believe that another person or uh, acts or acts as his agent. So if the principal uh, presents himself in a manner that to suggest that he has appointed an agent or someone acts as his agent, then the court will presume that there is that agency relationship. So his conduct in the particular circumstances precludes him from uh, denying the authority of that person to act as his agent. So the conduct of this principal will, will deny him from denying that he had appointed an agent to act on his behalf. So it depends on the conduct and the manner in which the principal was acting, agency by uh, estopel. And how he has, was acting uh, to prove or show that he had appointed an agent uh, will stop him from denying those uh, assertions. So uh, we also have agency by cohabitation, and this is where there is a marriage or a relationship. So the husband is presumed to be a principal under common law, and the wife is like an agent or acts as an agent in matters of necessities. So a husband uh, will appoint uh, a wife, or is assumed to have appointed the wife as or to act as his agent in matters uh, dealing with necessities. So during cohabitation, there is a presumption arising from the circumstances of cohabitation of the husband's cohabitation of uh, the husband's assent to con contracts made by the wife for necess necessaries suitable uh, to his degree and estate. So a husband assents the contract that is suitable to his degree and estate uh, to the wife contracts made by wife. So husband will assent to those contracts made by wife. So an husband here acts as a principal. So uh, this was uh, this was the position of court in the case of um, a Tarrington a versus Parrot, a 1703 X Salk 128. A Tarrington versus Parrot. So Lord C.J. Holt uh, conti continued by state, saying that while they while they cohabit, the husband shall answer all accounts, all contracts of hers for necessaries. The husband shall answer all contracts of hers for necessaries. For his uh, assent shall be presumed uh, to all necessary contracts upon the account of cohabiting, 
unless the contrary appears. So the husband's assent uh, shall, to the necessary, so contract made to the necessary shall be presumed uh, shall be presumed to all necessary contracts upon the account of cohabiting. So the husband will assent to contracts that relate to the necessary signed to entered by the wife um, in that uh, relationship. So that is according to uh, Lord C.J. Holt that uh, when the cohabiting the husband shall answer all contracts of hers for necessaries for his assent shall be presumed to all necessary contracts. So the thing here is the necessaries and the asset of a husband. So as the husband must only uh, put us into contract that lead to necessaries. So when a husband, when a, when is a husband liable? Say look, let's look at um, instances where a husband may be liable. So in Philipson versus Hater Law R six um, six CP that eight eighteen seventy Philipson versus Hater Law, uh, Boville CJ stated as follows: What the law infers is this: that his wife has authority to contra contract for things that are really necessary and suitable for the style in which the husband chooses to live. In so far as the article. Of uh, fa or fail, or article fail within, fail fairly within the do, the domestic department, which is ordinarily continued to the continued to the to the management of the wife. So an husband can raise a rebuttal under this uh, cohabitation or under in a contract made by the wife and in cohabitation or doing that uh, cohabiting. So um, the the husband may rebut the presumption if he shows that uh, the wife was adequately provided with necessaries or with sufficient means to obtain them. So if the husband proved that. Uh, I say that the main thing here is the necessaries. So if the husband shows that he provided all the necessaries, then he can rebut to that contract. Another scenario is where he had uh, forbidden her from pledging his credit, and that this fact was du uh, was duly notified to the parties dealing with her. So the husband had notified the parties who had dealt with the third parties who dealt with the wife, and he had forbidden the wife from entering into that contract or pledging his credit then he can also raise a rebuttal. Another instance is where he has continued, he has cautioned the specific transfers not to supply goods on credit or that he had given reasonable public notice disclaiming liability for his uh, wife's de death. So if he had warned the supplier not to uh, offer goods or supply goods on credit terms, then he can also exempt liability or he can raise a rebuttal. So if he had um, if he had cautioned the specific tradesman, the specific tradesman that third party who did to the wife uh, not to supply goods on credit, or so he had given a reasonable public notice. Another instance is where the goods so procured were excessive in quality and extravagant in quality, or were otherwise unsuitable or unsatisfactory. So if the goods were ex in excess, if the goods were not suitable. If the goods um, were otherwise unsuitable and they were excess in quality, not as per the agreement, then the husband can also have that ground to seek a rebuttal. Another instance is where another uh, formation of agency or another way a formation of agency can be formed is by ratification or signing. So in principal act, the agent is done by the first instance without or in excess of authority does not bind the principal. So um, an act of agent done in the first instance in excess or without authority does not bind the principal. Does not bind the principal. So, um, so if the principal uh, ratifies and adopts that uh, contract uh, purportedly made by his agent with the third parties, with the third parties uh, for the aid of his behalf or, or for for and on his behalf either without or any transcendent authority or in excessive of such authority as he said he will be bound by the act so um, signature prima facie means acceptance as a general rule signature prima facie means acceptance so um, a principle is not bound by um, 
by uh, authorities that are over uh, his authorities that are beyond his authorities but when he ratifies uh, that particular contract that has been entered between the agent and the third parties then it means that he will be bound by that agreement contractual agreement whether or not it was beyond his powers he is still bound by that agreement because he had uh, ratified that agreement so when the principal ratifies or signs that agreement then uh, it means that he accepts that agreement and is bound by those agreement because signature prima facie means acceptance and this was also held in the case of Lestrange versus uh, Lestrange versus Grocob. So uh, that one that uh, involved exemptions liability. So um, Chief Justice uh, Tyndall in Wilson versus Tuman, six man and GR 23, 1843. Chief Justice Tyndall in Wilson versus Tuman stated that. Um, that an act done for another by a person not assuming to act for him to act for himself but for such other person though without any precedent authority whatever becomes the act of the principle if subsequent uh, if sub if subsequently ratified by him is the known and well established rule of law and in that case the principle is bound by the act witness by the act and uh, Witness, witnesses it uh, for his uh, detriment or for his advantage and whether it will be founded on a tort of contract to the same extent as being and with all consequences which follows from the same act done by his uh, previous act. So uh, this just uh, means that when the principal ratifies that agreement or signs that uh, contract, that means that he is already bound uh, by that agreement that's the what it's trying to say tell us so uh, let's look at the requirements for ratification or the requirements for signing so uh, the principal must sign to the whole contract not part of it so the so the for the uh, for the ratified contract to be to bind the principal the following conditions must be met the principal must sign the, must ratify the whole contract not part of it not uh, but specific laws by an exempt others. You must just sign to all the contract. The principal must sign to all contract. Ratification must be within a reasonable time. It must not exceed that uh, specified time. It must be within a reasonable time. The principal must have been uh, disclosed. That contract must disclose the principal before the principal signs that contract. So the, the principal must have had contractual capacity. The principal must have had contractual capacity, the capacity to enter into a contract. He, 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 can, he must be of sound mind, he must not be bankrupt, he must not be a minor. You have contractual capacity, people who cannot enter into contract. So he must have that contractual capacity before he signs. And the particulars of the contracts must be known to the principal. The particulars of the contracts must be known to the principal. And the contracts must be lawful and enforceable. It must be lawful. Legal contracts cannot be entered by the principal. So another type, another formation of agency, another way in which agency can be formed is agency by the operation of the law. And this is where the law, uh, law uh, allows that agency to operate. And in the cases of accidents, an agent can act uh, to protect uh, some particular goods or property. So can act. So an agent acts out of genuine emergency or necessary necessity to protect the principal's property or interest in goods from imminent danger of perishing from liability or waste or deterioration. So here the agent will not be liable if um, he acts in a manner to protect the goods of the principal. And uh, this is just an exemption to the general rule that, uh, and this must be a matter of genuine emergency, it must be a matter of genuine emergency where he acts to protect the goals of the principal. So uh, a shareholder is not involved in contractual in the contracts but uh, will be held responsible under other contracts. But there is exem exemption here is under the contract of agencies where a shareholder a shareholder will not, will not be involved um, or held liable in the so it's it's a requirement that a shareholder is responsible for um, things that 
the, the agents or other people do in relationship to that um, or to what the agent has done or committed. So the shareholder will be liable under the master servant relationship of vicarious liability. The master is, is um, liable for the acts of the servant, but under agency, the, the master is not liable for what the agent does. So the general rule, uh, so let's look at the rights and duty, duties under the contract of agency. So an agent does not incur personal liability and has no rights with regard to that parties and if he acts within the scope of his authority. So uh, the agent has no, does not incur liabilities when he acts with the third parties. He does not incur personal liabilities. He does not incur personal liabilities. He does not have those personal responsibilities. And uh, when he acts within the scope of his authority. So if you are an agent and you act within the scope of your authority or what you are authorized by your principal, then you will not uh, incur li personal liability. Unless he expressly assumes personal liability to the third party with whom he contracts. So if he assumes personal liability with the party that he contracts, personal liability that he personally will be liable, then he will uh, have those personal liability be liable. And if you also, um, if the custom or the usage of trade or business profession in which he is engaged detects that he is, he is personally liable to the third party. So if that custom or the usage of trade, if that trade describes that he'll be personal, that business engagement prescribe that the agent will be personally liable, then he'll incur personal liabilities or be held responsible. So uh, is, the agent is not responsible in that dealing with the third parties, the, but the principal is. But we have a scenario where the agent can incur those personal liabilities, where the agreement has stated that the agent was to incur personal liability, or um, if ex he expressly assumes the personal liability in that relationship with the third parties, or if he draws and signs the negotiation instrument in his own name without indicating the principal. So if he draws to sign that uh, contract with the instrument in his own name, without the name of the principal, then he will incur personal liability in that contractual agreement of this. So if he does so in his capacity as an agent for another person, and also if he purposes to act for a principal who in fact does not exist and execute a deed in his own name while leading the third parties to believe that he does so as an agent. So if the principal does not exist and make the third parties believe that he is acting so as an agent, then he can also incur personal liability. And if he, if he acts without or in excess of his authority in breach of the implied warranty or authority. So the implied duties of an agent uh, are to perform those acts in which he has contractually undertaken to perform as long as the acts in question are lawfully and not rendered void by the statute or common law. So those are the responsibility implied by the statute to perform those responsibility that are legal as prescribed by the statute or uh, any law, common law, and to obey all lawful orders and instruction to of his principle and to do all things necessary and incidental to the execution of the express authority, to do everything that is prescribed to him by the principle, to exercise due care and skills in the performance of his part in the contract, uh, uh, the standard of care in which an agent his position will usually possess and exercise. So to perform the duty of care with reasonable skills that he has and to act personally since agency in a contractual relationship where the principal exposes the truth and confidence from the agency personal. So to act personally, since agency is a contractual relationship where the principal responses trust and confidence on agent personally. So the principal will then trust the agent. So the agent is also supposed to um, act personally and to respect the principal's title of title to goods and money received on his behalf in the course of business. So if he receive that money to, in the course of business, he must respect and give the money to the principal and to respect the principal's title in titles to goods. He has no title. The principal has the title. He must respect the authority, the principle of title, and uh, to honestly discharge his fiduciary duties of trust and confidence and to act with due uh, fidelity. So a uh, termination of agency. An agency can be terminated uh, where the, by the operation of the law or by an act of parties.
So if those parties decide to terminate this agency, the principal and the agent, the agency can be terminated or the operation of the law. And an agency relationship is determined by the act of parties, by mutual agreement, by the agent renouncing his authority or by revocation of the agent. The agent can be revoked or it can, he can't denounce his authority or saying that to claim that he's not uh, going to perform as an agent any more any longer. So the termination by the operation of the law is when the is also another way which agency can be terminated. When by performance or completion of transaction is where the agent where when of which the agent is employed. So if the agent has already performed that task for which he was employed, then agents agent an agency can be terminated and upon the expiry of uh, the fixed period. So if this agency was to last for a specified period and this period has elapsed, then that agency can be brought to an end or terminated. By happening of some events which renders the agency unlawful or unenforceable, such a subsequent illegality or destructiveness of the subject matter. So if there's up, some happening that will render this, at, term, this agency illegal by operation of the law, then it can be terminated. And if the term, subject matter the, has been distracted, that subject matter, then the agency can also be um, terminated. And if the principal dies or the either of the parties dies or is insane or is declared bankrupt, then that agency agreement can be terminated. So guys, um, I think uh, we have understood about the law of agencies. We'll be talking about uh, this law of agencies, the formation of agencies by cohabitation, by estopel, by the formation of the law, by um, rectification, the types of agencies, and uh, the duties and obligations of these parties, the principal and the agent. And we have also talked about um, the case laws that concern these agencies in various categories under the formation of agencies and what uh, the various um, CJs were talking about these agencies, the whole CJ and the rest. And I think, guys, you've understood about this law of agencies. And that is the end of my episode. Subscribe to Scott's Legal Channel, comment on the comment section, and like and share the episodes as well.